Welcome to Belfast Real. Um, today's guest is Christopher Keevil. Um, Christopher, who was originally working as a carpenter and house builder, is a now an ordained Zen priest and senior Dharma teacher in the single floor Sangha. Is that right? Sangha, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he has been practicing Zen since 1991. Um, Christopher has also been teaching since 1998 in the lineage of his teacher, Zen master Bo Mun, uh, or George Bowman. Uh, Christopher is also the managing director and founder of the Wellspring Consulting. Uh, it's a national firm that helps uh, non-profit leaders develop strategy for the future in areas such as education, health, and other uh, far-reaching areas. Uh, Christopher is also does book um, Finding Zen in the Ordinary, and that's what we're here to talk about today. And it comes out on the 26th of February. So, Christopher, thanks very much for coming on. Um, it's good to have you here. It's excellent to be with you today, Jonathan. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Um, so, so Christopher, just to, to get started, um, how, how did you get in the Zen? How did, how did that come about? Yeah, well, I have always had a, a spiritual interest in my life. I remember as a young boy um, thinking about spiritual matters, uh, God, I found uh, going to church meaningful. And my grandmother was, in fact, a minister. And, and uh, I remember talking with her about some of her uh, beliefs. But as I became uh, a young adult uh, and then a little older, I got really interested in uh, a deliberate spiritual practice of investing in really a regular spiritual practice. It, it occurred to me that if I was going to learn tennis, I would get a tennis teacher or a musical instrument. I would get a uh, a teacher of that instrument. So why not find somebody who was actually really dedicated to spiritual practice and try to learn and see how that went. And I spent a few years actually going to different kinds of activities, a yoga center. I went to uh, different places where meditation was being taught. And I, um, on the, uh, uh, an evening, which was actually the first evening of the first Gulf War, uh, which was uh, back uh, uh, in the 1990s, um, I was at a, uh, a place called the Cambridge Buddhist Med Meditation Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, uh, and while uh, we were meditating, uh, the head person at the front announced that the bombing of Baghdad had just started. And I felt this tremendous sense of personal responsibility that my tax dollars had helped pay for the, all of that destruction. I didn't know the policies behind it, or you know, I couldn't say it was totally right or totally wrong, but I felt this great weight of, of responsibility and great sorrow for it. And I was very moved because there was a guest teacher there that evening who, uh, who was gonna give a talk, but he got up in front of the group and he said, my heart is in my mouth. I really can only lead us in chanting uh, given uh, these uh, recent events. And so he led us in Buddhist chants to Avalokiteshvara, which is the um, kind of the uh, embodiment of compassion, the embodiment of compassion toward the world and toward humanity and toward each other. And we chanted, uh, people left because they were here there for a talk, but I, I was so deeply moved by that. And so uh, I felt uh, that here was somebody I felt was very straightforward and trying to do his best to put forward a really honest spiritual expression of, uh, for the current situation. So since then, I practiced, practiced and learned from him for many years. I sat uh, in meditation when I was working in Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, for uh, a, a number of years. And then I moved back to Connecticut where uh, in, in the United States where I live now. And uh, my uh, teacher, George Bowman, moved to Kentucky, which is uh, you know several a thousand miles south of where I am here. And then uh, more recently, we've been talking once a week by phone and doing what's called koan study, which are Zen stories, which help to open the heart and mind. And so we have a regular weekly practice. And from that, I've uh, found a great uh, entry and development into uh, sort of the uh, central uh, spiritual awakening of Zen. And um, what, the, going to ask two questions here, what, uh, what attracted you to to, to Zen itself, um, and for anyone watching, because I know um, sometimes when I've heard people before who've maybe read one book on Zen and they say, well, I'm an expert now, and then someone oh. goes, what well, is Zen? They go, it's a sign of one hand clapping. People are like, you've, you've lost me. So 
the two questions would be what what is them for, for people who maybe uh, uh, like myself and we don't don't know a lot about it and what attracted you to to them uh, yeah. initially well i'll take your second question first in that um i had always felt in my own spiritual interests that there was something that was very difficult very very not possible to talk about at the core of spiritual awareness or opening that there's this kind of amazing um, presence in all around us but opens up at times and i think most of us have had that kind of experience where something seems amazingly clean or open or clear but it's very it, it doesn't make sense to talk about it very much it's not something you can really describe exactly it's a, just a deep experience I found in reading some of the ancient uh, texts from, from Zen, the ones where the original Zen teachers had laid down the teachings, the same kind of direct expression of opening, where I had found it talked about in a lot of places, but it was much more present for me. In, so that's really what drew me to it. I felt like, here's, here it is. It's right in front of me here. This is the awareness of deep spiritual presence being manifest through the language and the expression of uh, what I see here. So I was actually deeply excited. I was like, oh my gosh, it's not something I need to go looking for someday, but it's right here in this practice. And, and I think then uh, when, when you ask what is Zen, uh, I, I suppose in one way it's a, it's a centuries old tradition of people who are um, Zen teachers like my teacher are in a lineage of teachers that are traced all the way back to Buddha in, um, in India, uh, 500 years before Christ. And, um, and so there's a very, very deep uh, uh, process of um, working out how to engage in spiritual growth through that tradition. So it's quite different than somebody who's, uh, you know, sort of a great speaker and very charismatic and gets everybody thinking about religion, um, but it, it, it's something that has a deep tradition. So I think Zen ha has a tradition to it. Yeah. And then I would say also Zen is basically the process of being present with this moment right now and taking it for what it is and letting go of concepts and descriptions and expectations. It's not always entirely pleasant, but one gets one's whole life. One gets to be truly me. You, would get, you get to be truly you. We get to be honestly ourselves, which is in some ways the greatest gift that life has to offer us. So uh, from that perspective, it's, it's one of the most amazing things that one can engage in. Yeah, would, would, it, would this description be accurate then? It, it, it's almost like um, you, obviously our minds are constantly racing. You're, you're thinking about what you have to do in the next hour, uh, next month, and then you're thinking with things in the past. Um, so, so Zen would be right saying in a nutshell, Zen kind of it's about if your mind was like if you, if you imagine your mind was like a like a pond and it's all rough, all the ideas racing around your head. The focus of Zen would then be to almost calm that, like like a like like a, like a glass of water, it's completely still. Not is that, is that would that be right? It is in. Uh, one aspect, uh, I, one of the teachers that writes about this talks about a, a glass of like uh, apple cider where it has, you know, slowly, you know, if you leave it there for an hour or two, the, the sediment will go to the bottom, sort of this settling process. Yeah. But there's another important aspect, which is the settling is a training for daily life. And so what it helps with is for me talking with you right now, or for me, uh, going into a meeting with one of my clients, I bring a, um, a, a practice to that, which is a steadiness and a presence. So there can be times that are very tumultuous and very challenging, uh, very difficult interactions, demanding situations. And so it's not always about stilling the mind entirely, but it's bringing a core of stillness and presence to any situation uh, and therefore really being able to take the very best action without being caught up with fear or uh, self-aggrandizement or expectations in a way that distracts one from the best action. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, how has your, your Zen practice been, obviously you mentioned 
you use it for obviously going to meetings and, and, and etc. Mm. How has your Zen practice then affected uh, the rest of your life and, mm. and how you live? Yeah, I am um, regularly experience challenges and discomfort just like all of us do. And uh, in a in a Zen practice, one doesn't get away from the challenges of life. Uh, there's not a experience of now I've realized something and I no longer struggle and suffer, um, which was an important realization that I really have come to deeply understand, but I don't think I really, I didn't want it to be that way. I wanted a way out of some of the challenges of life yeah. uh, is one of my ear earlier interests in, in finding a spiritual practice. But for instance, uh, yesterday I, I'm the uh, run, it, run a consulting firm with 20 staff members. Um, I had to talk with one of the individuals in the company to say that, uh, you know, give them some bad news. And uh, uh, I, I tried to bring myself to the fore to do it in as um, human and compassionate and present way, because bringing bad news to an employee can be a very difficult thing for that employee. And yet I had to do it because of the nature of his work and our work at the company. So I think it would influence, my practice would influence how I bring bad news to an employee, for instance. Uh, I think it influences my care for my wife. I realize that um, as I've grown in my life, I think I've tried to be less self-centered and think that my wife should be there for me and realize more that um, it's so important that I think of her needs and I put her before me um, a lot of the time to be helpful. And um, that sounds kind of trite in a way, but the actual ability to do that is challenging at times when one is tired or scared or has high expectations. And I think my practice has led me to have a little more ability to be considerate and attentive to others and their needs. Yeah. Um, in, in your book, um, Finding Zen um, in the Ordinary, uh, the you have conversations with your, your Zen uh, teacher, Ruth Manson, uh, Zen master, Bowman. Um, what was important about those dialogues uh, for yourself and, and obviously for the inclusion and within, within the book itself? Mm. I um, came to realize that it was, it, it would not have been imp possible for me to gain uh, as much awareness of spiritual insight and life and how to live life without a ongoing relationship with someone who had practiced deeply before me. Uh, and uh, he's been at it for 50 years and has worked with several thousand students and has been practicing and meditating for all that time. And so the depth of his, of his experience drew me forward to address certain challenges that I um, I don't think I could see. I mean, one of the things he would say to me is, is let go of your complaint, Chris. And I would think to myself, I'm not complaining. I'm just talking about how painful my life is in this or that situation. But I started realizing that by talking about my pain, I was objectifying it and owning it as something that defined me. And I could then let it go and realize it's just the weather. It's just my internal weather. And sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's not. And I don't need to get stuck on using that as defining my life. And it was very freeing because I could realize that pain comes and goes. And then there are other days I'm joyful and, and I'm excited and my energy is great. And, and that's the way I am also. And so um, it was through my relationship with him that I started to see how I was stuck on certain concepts about myself that were in fact not helpful. Yeah. And I included some dialogues with my teacher because I had found them so meaningful. And I felt that they, for a reader who's interested, might find them really meaningful too, not only because of the things he says, which I felt were really helpful, and I put some of those in the book, uh, but also because to demonstrate the value of the teacher relationship, which again, has allowed me to see things I don't think I would not have seen otherwise. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so with obviously, uh, like, like, like with any teacher, um, they, they've reached a level where they as you come along, they're able to point things out that mm -hmm. you just walk, otherwise you just walk past and, and, and not be not be totally aware. 
Mm -hmm. um, in in the the again staying with your 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 instructor, your master, um, in, in the reference section of the book, um, you include uh, as in Master Goldman's uh, ten principles of Zen. Um, if you what what could briefly even what what are they um, and why did they why were they included in in the book? I uh, in working with him. Uh, started realizing that um, the same themes were coming up. Um, you know, maybe a year later, uh, something would come up and it would seem like we were talking about the same issue and the same theme. It was somewhat humbling because I didn't think I was getting very far because I kept s s facing the same issues. But um, he said at one point, I think there may be only 10 principles in Zen, uh, which got me curious. Um, and I said, well, could you... Uh, could you say what they are? And he said, well, I don't know, let me see. It wasn't like he had ever laid them out, but he started talking and I was taking notes. And uh, when I look back at my notes later, I realized he had really laid out 10 principles. And as I thought about it further, I realized that the 10 principles could be correlated with all 48 stories in the book I had just written, Finding Zen in the Ordinary. And, uh, uh, that surprised me too, because I had put the book together very much from an intuitive sense. I had just written the various different memories and experiences out. But as I look back over all of the things I'd written down, I could correlate stories to certain principles and certain principles to certain stories. And so I actually have a table, series of tables that show that correlation in the back of the book. And I did that in part to show that while the stories seem like simple stories out of life, it's also a teaching manual because it shows through example, the basic fundamentals of Zen. And if a student was to take up the book uh, uh, care thoughtfully, I think they would gain a lot in terms of what is, uh, what are the principles at the core of Zen through examples and through description. Yeah. Um, go, go uh, back, you were saying that, um almost originally you kind of thought I'll, I'll reach, when you started saying yourself, you thought uh, you would reach a, a level where kind of a lot of things wouldn't, wouldn't bother you. I think a lot of people would kind of think think that way in, in life. Um, you, you think I get that job, it's almost like a promised land. I, I get that job and my life is, is going to be golden from here on in. Yeah. And then you, you find there's a whole new set of problems and all. So, so, <laughs> The, the essence of Zen is kind of, um, it, it's the teach, it would be right, it would be te the teach you how to kind of, again, I'm sorry for using these analogies, it would be almost like a ship in the ocean. You, you want to try and keep yourself balanced while the seas kind of, mm -hmm. it, it, your life, life issues are still going to be there, but mm. it, it kind of, it, it teaches you how to kind of um, navigate them without, mm. About, about being pulled apart. Is that, mm. is that right? yeah. yeah, I think that's a lovely analogy. Yeah, you can imagine a, uh, a well-experienced uh, sailor would head the boat into the waves and, and bring down the sails in a storm and you know, know how to navigate through uh, the weather uh, and the challenges and uh, you know, uh, be careful around land to not run aground. And, and I think it's very similar. It's that life is a certain way, just as the ocean is a certain way. And one uh, can learn about the ups and downs of life and how to navigate it with equanimity and how things like expressing love to others and being oriented towards service and care and being uh, careful and caring to oneself helps life. But it needs to be done in a very aware way, not dogmatically, but each moment is different. And each moment then calls on us to come forward to uh, live it in the very best way we can. And so I think that's really at the heart of what uh, true Zen practice is. It's, it's not like a, there's a lot of popular books which talk about uh, things that are very wonderful to read and make you feel really good and how lovely everything is. Uh, and that's a nice entry point. It is true that things can become very lovely with uh, a spiritual insight. But they can also become more challenging because one is trying to really live in the middle of one's own life and not avoid it. And so it's not really a practice that leads to um, 
less difficulty or challenge or discomfort, but a practice that helps the navigation of that. So one really has the most fulfilling life. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's, I suppose that's probably the, 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 the attractive side to it. it it's, it's a hands-on um, mm -hmm. uh, thing. It, it, it's not kind of like you get told something, you think, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll think about that, but it's something that you can actually uh, let's put into practice. That, that's mm -hmm. almost like, like, a, like, a, like maybe it's one thing to say. It's like an, almost like a, like a series of exercises you can mm -hmm. put into daily practice. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would you want um, or hope for the, for the reader to take away from, from, from the book? Um, what, 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 what would you think when you write and what, what would like people to, as a, as a takeaway from it? Sure. Uh, yeah, so in, in the book, Finding Zen in the Ordinary, I hope very much that it's a gift uh, for someone reading it. And uh, I know from people who have read it, and I've shared it with a number of people at this point, uh, many of them have experienced it that way, that it reminds them of their own moments of awareness in life, moments where they suddenly realized the greater context of life or had a sense of peacefulness or a great appreciation for uh, some person or some situation. And my hope was that it would be a experience of Zen, not reading about Zen. Yeah. Uh, it's not a how-to manual or a description of what will happen when you arrive. It's intended to induce the very experiences that Zen draw, uh, draws you towards. And so by reading it, my hope is that people actually have some experience of, of moments of uh, awakening and awareness in their own lives. Uh, and I think it can be accessible to people who know nothing about Zen, uh, but is also a uh, designed to be meaningful to people who are very experienced in Zen because it correlates to the fundamentals of Zen practice. Yeah. And um, obviously, continue with that. How, how can Zen help us today? Obviously, um, look, I suppose today would be kind of a, what's going on is almost like ideal uh, environment for obviously for someone to get, get in the Zen. Um, how, how, how can Zen help, help, help people today in, in, in general? Yeah, well, I would say um, my experience is that when I've, over time, as I've learned to be more present with my life in its joys and in its challenges, I would say it's become easier for me to um, feel appreciative and steady. So in the midst of COVID, for instance, it's been hard sometimes. I think for all of us, I'm sure, in our homes, a lot of video, not being able to see other people who are important to us. Uh, but I, I find that I, I'm not stuck on it. In a sense, it's like there's some wonderful um, things about it as well. As I mentioned, I'm spending a lot more time with my wife and um, I'm having a chance to get more sleep because I'm not traveling. And, and so there's pluses and minuses in any situation. And I think that's very helpful to living one's life. I think that uh, one can then over time build a life uh, that's more fulfilling, but it's not that I've suddenly got something or that someone who reads this book or does send Zen will suddenly you know, have a, in a flash or an awareness and their life will be more fulfilling, but it can be something that accrues over time that builds such that people um, gain stability and equanimity and presence and and own their own lives in a much deeper way yeah well, definitely and um what um basically was a wrote, wrote a question here which this was like what was one of the biggest lessons uh, from mm -hmm. your own life but what would be i would like to change that what was one of the biggest lessons that you that, that you got from from zen uh yeah, I think um, in a way, I thought that there was something that I could achieve that would bring me greater happiness. Mm -hmm. I think probably the central or biggest lesson I've learned is the 
thing to achieve is this particular moment right now, this situation, how it is. And then, you know, one hour from now, that situation. And it doesn't seem like that would be very attractive. It seems like, you know, who would want that? Uh, I'm trying to, you know, have more happiness and less challenge in my life. Uh, But the thing I've learned is that we spend, I spend so much time avoiding what I think is going to happen or what I wish didn't happen or planning for the next thing to happen. I lose my present life and I'm walking through life without really noticing myself and the people around me. And so there's a tremendous richness that I'm not receiving. And so that I think has been the central teaching of Zen for me. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's very easy to kind of, um, I I know from your personal self, you, you kind of believe that I say years ago, I I used to think if I got a certain job, I was a very Manson there life is going to be uh life is going to be sorted you're not going to have any worries and that's quite, yeah. going to be quite naive and stupid but i think we do kind of fall into that um yeah if we get a house get get the job get the girl the guy or whatever right like that's it i'm, I'm, I'm meant to. And i think in a way uh from my own uh modest kind of like the, the view on the world it, i think the the challenges um that we get in life are, are actually as much as they can cause us angst, they're they're really they're essential um, to, to, to to yourself and your own, own development. Mm. Um, obviously, uh, I, I know we're we're, we're we're tight for time today. Um, what what's next for, for yourself then? Uh, after you, will you work on a, on a follow up book um, mm. or like an online program or anything like that? Yeah, I. Um... Well, I've uh, been tweeting regularly. I, I, I tweet on Twitter every day. My handle is at Chris Kievel. Uh, so that's the at, at sign and then C-H-R-I-S-K-E-E-V like victory, I-L like Larry. So at Chris Kievel. And I, through that, seek to offer uh, moments of meditative awareness and uh people may find that of some use. So that's in some ways a continuation of the work I was doing in this book uh, uh, in a diff- very different format, but the same intent to offer some awareness that can be a gift to other people. Um, I am currently working on a book that's different, but comes out of my role as a management consultant to uh, nonprofit organizations where I work with groups that you know help children or homeless people or uh, kids get to college, and I've been uh, deeply inspired by leaders in the environment in which I work. And so I'm writing stories about the inspiring um, people I've interacted with uh, as leaders in the nonprofit environment. And in a way, it's not Zen, but it's the same sense of appreciation for the present moment and what I'm in the midst of. Yeah. Um, uh... Obviously, I know at the moment um, everything's kind of crazy. I think uh, yeah. around the world, and maybe but maybe a wrong question to ask. But I'm just curious, from a Zen perspective, um, uh, are you, would you be optimistic about where we're heading in general, or 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 would you be maybe a wee bit of pessimi- pessimistic about where we're heading? I would say I bring a uh, I, I, from a Zen perspective, a, a great sense of possibility to the future, that there is much we don't and cannot know, and there's a tremendous set of opportunities for um, awareness, for kindness, for um, loving exchange, for helpfulness with others, and those things can be deeply inspiring. And I think there's all sorts of opportunity, particularly even in challenging times, there may be more opportunity sometimes for those kind of things to be true. I do think that we are in tumultuous times and we have uh, a lot we're facing. Um, the environment, uh, COVID, uh, changes in governments. And so uh, we're also um, 
facing those kind of things as well. But I think it, in a way, it's all the human condition. In I think most of the problems we face are all brought on by the human condition. So to be a truly fine human being is perhaps the best thing we can do to address the situations we find ourselves in. Yeah. We, just a thought came to my head that when you're, you're talking like that, mm. would we, as a species, are, are we kind of more focused on the, ex the exterior than, than the internal? Mm. Um, do, do, do you think we, we, we've kind of maybe, we're, we're on balance in that way, that we're, we're, we're maybe compared to maybe years, uh, hundreds of years ago, we're, we're more focused on on the external than, than the internal, mm. maybe neglecting that side of ourselves, and it's kind of having a bit of a, a reverberation effect. Perhaps, yes. I mean, if you look at our current um, Western European uh, based society, uh, it has become strongly materialistic um, and uh, you know, corporations have been the become the biggest and most, um, uh, you know, perhaps the biggest budgets of any entities in the world. And so that raises concerns. I think it's a pendulum swing that some at some point will swing probably back away from that. Yeah. Um, however, there's also a tremendous um, ability to interact in all sorts of ways in our world now. And if you want to listen to Belfast Real TV, or you want to uh, learn about Buddhism, about you know carpentry, or about um, anything, uh, the, there's a, such a vast opportunity, and there's so many uh, uh, such an explosion of niches of ways that people can engage. I think that in a way, um, that amount of opportunity is uh, a counterbalance to some of the materialism that's going on and, and therefore we can follow our paths. We're not, many of us not stuck in societies where we are tightly constrained in what we have to believe or how we spend our time. So I think that there's, again, pluses and minuses and it's, it's more about the particular configuration we're in uh, is different than in other years, but it brings some remarkable positives and some major difficulties. Yeah. That, that definitely I mean um, even doing this uh, it was like 10 20 years ago um, doing this podcast would be with the current restrictions would be not possible or would that would have to literally uh, shut up shop but yeah. again, with with, uh, with the internet with everyone being at home as well is, is a big help <laughs> right. able to do this. No, definitely and, and I mean I think even the amount of online courses um, oh right is available now and, and you're even seeing more even the health like our national health service pushing mindfulness um right. anxiety mm -hmm. and depression they're, they're, right. they're pushing that more and i think law mm -hmm. firms are offering um mindfulness courses to mm -hmm. help their employees yeah. with stress um so you, you already mentioned that you're on twitter um if anyone wants to get in touch with you uh about Zen or, or even the, the book, where, where can they get the book? I know I already mentioned the book comes out on the yeah. 26th of February. Um, mm -hmm. where, where can they get that and how can they to get in touch with you? About, um, yes, yes. Um, and I think that the book is gonna come out around the end of February. I think uh, at least on the US Amazon site, it comes out on March 1st. Oh so it's, it's right around that time period. And uh, it's available through Amazon in the UK and in the United States and uh, other English speaking countries. Yeah. Um, it, uh, I have a website for the book. It's at www.findingzeninteordinary.com, uh, findingzeninteordinary.com. And uh, in there, there's uh, a button to click and also a page to go to to find places to buy the book. Uh, it's available through uh, Borders Books and other book uh, places. It's it's going to be in certain physical bookstores that carry uh, this kind of uh, material. And uh, there's also a, a page on the book website, uh, again, uh, findings in, in the ordinary.com. And that page is a contact page. And there's a form that people can fill out if they're interested in contacting me. And I will be um, uh, monitoring that and we'll, we'll uh, 
uh, respond to people. So I would be glad to hear from people who have a, a serious interest in the book or in uh, what we've been talking about today. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll include the links to all those sites right. in the show, show notes below um, so people can click on below and get access to them. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. Um, it was great having you on and it was really great talking about with the book. Um, I recommend people to, to pick the book up. I think it's it, Zen, as I said before, um, I think the way some people maybe presented it, it, it kind of put people off. But I think your your book and your approach um, kind of brings people in um, and, and, and shows it in a more um, user-friendly way um, and, and, and makes it more more accessible to, to, to the ordinary person. So th thank you for, the, for, for, for a great book and um, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's a great treat to be on your show. And uh, I so appreciate that you share these uh, uh, episodes with people. I think it's a wonderful gift. Yeah, thank you.